was one of the biggest and bloodiest wars in recent European history, a result of secret collusion between two leaders. Any Bosniak would say yes. This is Mostar, the fifth largest city in the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and one of the top tourist destinations in the Balkans. Mostar was named after its bridge keepers, who in medieval times guarded the Starry Most over the Neretva River. The old bridge is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, originally built by the Ottomans in the 16th century, and it is a standout piece of their architecture. But similarly to many cultural relics in Europe, this one is a reconstruction of its original, possibly due to a deadly pact which intended to split Bosnia and Herzegovina in half and to remove it from the map almost entirely. Prior to the recent events in Ukraine, the war in Bosnia was the most destructive event in Europe since World War II. The Bosnian War resulted in more than 100,000 casualties and over 2 million people being displaced. The total cost of damage estimated to be around 100 billion. This and the other wars fought in the aftermath of the breakup of Yugoslavia set the Balkan region back in time with it still limping behind Europe economically. Politically, the term Balkans has become shorthand for division, difference and ethnic tension within European discourse. In Bosnia, the memory of war still lingers very strong in the minds of the locals. The war has shaped an entire generation. Most young adults have recollections of what happened, and many of their parents still struggle with post-traumatic stress. Indeed, whenever having a casual conversation, it is difficult to avoid the topic of war. It still affects not only their minds, but their daily lives as many half-destroyed buildings have been left scattered around parts of the country and are still waiting for repair or demolition. Much of the landscape and many of the forests are still waiting to be demined. It is no wonder the people cannot heal when the world they are living in still bears so many of its wounds for all to see. And for all the destruction caused, this conflict is generally very badly understood because it has three points of view, Croatian, Serbian and Bosnian, creating a lot of noise and propaganda. Everyone points their fingers at the other and someone's war hero is someone else's war criminal. The 1995 peace treaty was only allowed to happen in a three-way stalemate carving up Bosnia and Herzegovina for three different ethnic groups, with three different presidents. So the reporting, as well as much of the scholarship on the war, must be treated with considerable skepticism. All of the parties use propaganda, and everyone involved to some extent has either tried to claim fame, save face, or avoid persecution. So was there a conspiracy to erase a nation? Why did the Balkans turn to war? And what happened during the Battle of Mostar? As the Habsburg monarchy collapsed in the aftermath of World War I, a number of new states emerged, and the largest of these was the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Decades later, in the aftermath of World War II, it transitioned again, adopting a communist government due to it being inside the communist sphere of influence. Thus, the Federal People's Republic of Yugoslavia was established in 1946. It was a federation of six republics, with borders drawn along ethnic and historical lines. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Slovenia. Initially led by Josip Tito, who was named president for life until his death in 1980. Tito is a controversial figure who is seen as both a tyrant and a great leader. But from the perspective of Yugoslavia, it was under his rule that the nation experienced its golden age in the 60s and 70s. The citizens enjoyed more prosperity and freedom than most living under Soviet regimes. They were even allowed to emigrate and work in Europe. So by 1971, there were some 410,000 Yugoslavian workers in West Germany. For although Yugoslavia has for a long time worked to present communism with a human face, there have so far been no specific ideological instructions on the presentation of other portions of the communist anatomy. With her cantilevered corset and the frothy frou-frou beneath it, Natasha is one of the first Iron Curtain maidens to come in out of the Cold War to be a penthouse pet. If Nixon can go to Moscow and Peking, Penthouse can do its bit by spreading the good word of unabashed capitalism round Eastern Europe. This contamination of the purity of the socialist ideal worries the Yugoslav head of tourism not at all. 
Penthouse, as an organization, has an unmistakably Western capitalist flavor. Are you at all worried about an ideological incompatibility? I don't think there's any problem here regarding the ideological uh, viewpoint. I think I'm starting to see why people are nostalgic for Yugoslavia. Tito's relationship with Stalin was problematic from the start, and so it led him to devise a strategy which integrated Yugoslavia into the economy of the West, while remaining communist on paper. But Tito could not play both sides forever. When the Cold War started to wind down, Yugoslavia was no longer a crucial frontline state, being appeased and tolerated by both sides. So low interest and easy to gain money dried up and debts had to be paid. Yugoslavia had been borrowing money from both the East and West, leveraging its position between the two. And it all caught up to them in the 80s, right around the time that Tito's health started to fail. On 4th of May 1980, Tito's death was announced through state broadcasts across Yugoslavia. His death removed what many international political observers saw as Yugoslavia's main unifying force. And subsequently, ethnic tensions started to grow. The country was entirely paralyzed, incapable of decision making. The government structure was breaking down. High inflation, industries were going bankrupt. Only a year after Tito's death. So by the end of the 80s, Yugoslavia was a pretty bad place to be. One of the newly elected presidents was the Serbian communist leader, Slobodan Milosevic, a controversial figure to say the least. At this point in time, Yugoslavia was still a communist country. And in communism, any kind of nationalism is outlawed. And Milosevic, while he adamantly denied it, was essentially considered to be a Serbian nationalist. Media in Slovenia published articles comparing Milosevic to Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. As Milosevic sought to restore Serbian sovereignty, and he was accused of organizing Serbian rallies across the country, destabilizing the status quo. Milosevic didn't necessarily cause the breakup of the country as it was economically collapsing, and Croatia and Slovenia were interested in secession and integrating with Europe. But he certainly didn't help it stay together, despite publicly stating that he supported a united Yugoslavia. He may have truly wanted to keep the country together, but his idea of Yugoslavia probably necessitated that power rested in the hands of the Serbs and his own. Milosevic attempted changing the constitution to become a president for life, same as Tito, but as expected he faced a lot of resistance from non-Serb nationalities. However, as Yugoslavia was ethnically dominated by Serbians, Milosevic was able to employ other means of taking control of the country via propaganda and by dominating areas that were ethnically composed of Serbs and more importantly by taking control of the military, which he did in 1989. This period in Yugoslavia in the late 80s was nicknamed as Life in Big Serbia. In early 1991, it was clear that Yugoslavia was going to break up. But it was not yet decided how. An agreement was needed in order to prevent military action, as the situation was critical. So a number of meetings between the presidents of the republics took place discussing the details of the breakup. The most controversial of these meetings without doubt was the one between Milosevic and Tudman. Franjo Tudman was the president of the Croatian federal state of Yugoslavia. Officially they met in order to discuss how to have a peaceful dissolution of Yugoslavia. But it is speculated that they agreed on forceful repartitioning of Bosnia and Herzegovina between soon to be independent Croatia and Serbia. In other words, Bosnian lands were meant to be confiscated and their state was to be dissolved, divided between Serbians and Croatians. For Bosnian historians, the decisions made in this closed door meeting are not the stuff of conspiracy theories. Instead, these are irrefutable facts that won't soon be forgotten. Slovenia and Croatia declared independence in June 1991, North Macedonia in September. In theory, Yugoslavian army had to intervene in order to keep Yugoslavia together. But reality was that the Yugoslavian army was mostly made up of Serbs. And at this point, its real goal was to create a greater Serbia. War initially started in Slovenia and Croatia. In Slovenia, it lasted just 10 days. 
With it being the backyard of Austria and Italy, war was not in the cards. The UN intervened promptly and insisted that Slovenia be allowed to leave the Union. Not to mention that Slovenia was fairly homogenous, with very few Serbians living there who would be willing to break away. The Croatian War of Independence had a more sporadic beginning, as Serb nationals within Croatia declared independence and began military action. As a result, within about a month of fighting, Yugoslavian army controlled a third of the country, and then Bosnia passed its referendum for independence on 29th of February 1992. As was the case elsewhere, the Bosnian Serbs, supported by the Serbian government and the Yugoslav People's Army, mobilized their forces inside Bosnia in order to secure ethnic Serb territory. Shortly following, the war spread across the country into Bosnian majority territories also. And while the Bosnians and Croatians were on the same side at the beginning, the tables turned. The Croatians joined the war against Bosnians in October 1992. It was a war within a war. It started in central Bosnia and spread to Herzegovina, with most of the fighting taking place in those two regions. It consisted of sporadic conflicts with numerous ceasefires during its three-year course. However, it was not an all-out war between the Bosniaks and Croats, as they remained allied in other regions. The International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia determined that President Tudman's goals were to take control of majority Croatian areas. But of course, it may have been much more than that if we consider the possibility of some sort of agreement between Tudman and Milosevic. And the aggression against Bosnia certainly seems to confirm something was afoot. Serbian army attacked Mostar in April 1992. We didn't have army. Bosnian army wasn't like organized, wasn't formed. Uh, we had just Bosnian police. And first Bosnian police took part in defense of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Battle of Mostar also had two major chapters with the fighting between Croatian and Bosnian forces starting in 1993. As a result of first Serbian and then Croatian incursions into Mostar, it was the most heavily destroyed city in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In total, it experienced some four and a half years of almost uninterrupted warfare. The most affected were Bosniak populated areas, where around 60 to 75 percent of buildings were destroyed or very badly damaged. Between 1993 and 4, the gunfire and shelling barely ever stopped, accompanied by the wide-scale destruction of Ottoman and Islamic religious and cultural heritage. They at times completely cut off the passage of humanitarian aid. The population was forced to live in extremely harsh conditions, deprived of food, water, electricity and adequate care. We had 10 doctors. 10 doctors, 55,000 people. Wartime, and look at how our hospital was looking during the last war. Over 100,000 shells were launched into East Mostar alone. And as you can see, it is really not a very big area at all. In the end, Bosnian forces managed to hold and even retake territory they had lost. While the Croatians had an armaments advantage, the Battle of Mostar ended indecisively and the city was divided into two parts based on ethnic lines. In the end, the municipalities that had a Croat relative majority became all Croat and municipalities that had Bosniak majority became all Bosniak. According to what I have been told by local sources, it was the Neretva River which passed through Mostar and most of Herzegovina which was meant to be the dividing line that was to separate the conquered lands between Croatia and Serbia. And that is why the Croatians established many concentration camps in Herzegovina and not far from Mostar to make way for Croatian settlement. It is also why the fighting was so fierce with no regard for human casualties, with atrocities committed on all sides of the conflict, along with widespread destruction of mosques, the loss of the 400 27-year-old Mostar Bridge is considered as the worst of the atrocities committed, especially considering that it didn't really serve much of a strategic purpose. It was likely a purposeful destruction of cultural heritage. By destroying a relic from the Ottoman era, the Croats were making a statement that the Christian and Islamic worlds were not meant to coexist. 
Although Bosnians also argued that the religious difference being a source of tension and a cause of the war is generally overstated. The plan between Tudman and Milosevic was not about religion, but simply about creating a greater Serbia and a greater Croatia for their respective peoples. US involvement up to now had been limited, but as the casualty and atrocity list mounted, they stepped up in order to help mediate a peace treaty. In the face of a possible direct US involvement, a ceasefire was declared and official peace talks were soon on their way. So in November 1995, the Dayton Agreement was signed by presidents of Croatia, Bosnia and Serbia that ended the Bosnian War. The warring parties agreed to peace and to a single sovereign state known as Bosnia and Herzegovina, composed of two parts, the largely Serb populated Republic Srpska and mainly Croat Bosniak populated Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was decided to build a bridge as similar as possible to the original. The bridge was rebuilt with local materials in a Turkish company using Ottoman construction techniques. Hungarian army divers recovered stones from the riverbed for the purposes of reconstruction. So even some of the materials used are the same. The reconstructed bridge was inaugurated on 23rd of July 2004 and marks the cultural center of modern Mostar. Now this guy, who looks like he is about to jump, is not doing it for fun, but rather to get paid. No jumps will be made unless at least 30 or 50 euro are collected from onlookers. After all, it is a 20 to 25 meter fall, and there are only so many of those that a human body can take in its lifetime, even when executed in correct form. They have been doing this long enough that they need something extra keep them going. Still, these guys are kind of lucky. During the tourist season, they can make very respectable money when making multiple dives every day. Maybe even two to five thousand euro a month, I've been told. Very good considering most of the population scrape by on less than 500 euro a month. The economy has a lot of catching up to do. But it can't, because politically, it's still divided. And while the EU may have plans to eventually have all the Balkan countries become members, a lot of healing still needs to be done. And for many living with the repercussions of the war, questions persist. Why did all this have to happen? A joint statement in Geneva in 1993 by Milosevic and President Tudman said All speculation about a partition of Bosnia and Herzegovina between Croatia and Serbia are entirely unfounded. And most Croatian historians consider it a political myth because of a lack of direct evidence and the difficulty of explaining the Yugoslav wars with Croats and Serbs as the main antagonists. Indeed, if there was an agreement and a deal made, why did they end up in war with one another shortly afterwards? An interesting point made was that in the context of the conflict in Croatia, the meeting can be viewed as an attempt by Tudman to prevent a Serbo-Croatian war, where Croatia would face the full might of the Yugoslav army. Discussion of the partition of Bosnia and Herzegovina is therefore seen by some people as an attempt to avoid this conflict. So really what happened depends on who you ask, and what was really agreed upon or discussed we are probably never going to find out. There is a rumor that somebody has a tape recording of the meeting, but it has never been found. I suspect the theory, while having a silhouette of truth, is a little too convenient. It privileges human agency and offers a simple explanation for what was probably a much more complex reality. If there is anything I'm willing to believe, is that religion rarely in and of itself causes conflict, but rather political manipulation does. This is my Patreon map. Many thanks to all my long-term sponsors. Thank you all for your continued support. If you would like to reserve your spot, then get in touch 